I'm sure you all appreciate that window period because of the fact that this is the period that the guidelines talk about. Uh, a survivor of sexual violence must have received emergency pills, uh, P2, right? Mm -hmm. uh, within 72 hours. They must have also received, after they've been tested for HIV, post exposure prophylaxis within 72 hours. You see how I'm a quack, huh? But hey, I, I didn't tell you I have transitioned to being a lawyer. Nowadays, KMA has recognized me as a doctor. <laughs> So post-exposure prophylaxis and also STI prophylaxis, and if this person also needs stitching, they need uh, because of any tears uh, due to the propensity of the of the attack. So that's also another emergency. But what has happened over time is that we have a lot of cases that are reported to us of women and girls who have gone to hospitals, and then they have also we have a drug shortage. We have a stockout now. Within 72 hours, if this girl has to be traversing 16 hospitals to look for PEP, she's going to get fatigued, right? She's already gone through trauma. There is no desire at that point for her to have human contact. So what has happened over time is we, we have a drop of cases. A lot of girls who are going to say, I'm going to go home, and then I'll come back. And then they don't come back. And then all of you appreciate within 72 hours, if she's not come, then the window period is closed for her, and then we heighten her chances of getting HIV, right? So this is also something that I thought is important for us to note, as people who are working in emergency care, that you also have a role to push for ensuring that there are drugs in hospitals. Because your biggest frustrations as service providers is that it's not just your skill that is needed, but there's a lot of things that are needed to accompany what you give as emergency care. National guidelines on quality of obstetric and perinatal care. These are Ministry of Health guidelines. Every law that I've put here is rubber stamped and the, from the state. Huh? So these ones are on post abortal care. Post abortal care is care that is given to any woman or girl who has had an unsafe abortion and uh, she presents herself to the hospital clinic. Now, this is also regarded as an emergency service. Because at that point, many of the girls, if anyone has worked uh, in that sector or anyone who knows where Kenyatta World 1D is, knows that um, these are women who are coming to you when they've already perforated their uterus, they've pulled something inside there, they're bleeding, and they have a very high chance of dying. The law um, guided by the Ministry of Health National Guidelines on Quality of Surgical and Perinatal Care, as well as the National Guidelines on Management, no, uh, Standards and Guidelines on uh, reduction of uh, maternal, mortality, maternal mortality from unsafe abortion require that any person who sees this patient, first of all, give her emergency medical treatment. If she needs to go to theater, rush this person to theater, and then again, they see by die. Because one of the things that people will start talking about is the legality or illegality of abortion. But what the, the guidelines talk about is at that point, point of contact, the first point of contact, is you first save the life, and then after that, we now address the issue of how did this person actually get to a point where these are evaporated into us. On a clock of 36 hours, so by the time they're changing shift to another nurse, it's usually three patients to one nurse. So that's what we have in Kenya. And the capacity, bed capacity that we have, we are supposed to have like a recommended 200 beds in terms of ICU. I think by the time we were in Kenya, so this was in 2015, things may have improved because I did this case in 2015. The admission by Dr. Simon was that they had 56 beds. 56 beds were available at any point, but they were always full. All the beds in Kenya are always full. So those are some of the difficulties in terms of realizing and actualizing emergency care. And that's the quick summary. Did I speak Latin? No. no. <laughs> All right, good, good stuff. All right, before we move to Brian, let's get some questions. I'm sure there are many people ask questions. I'll start off. Um, but this whole story of Casey Badai, if I'm running my small hospital, I mean, how many Casey Badai's can I handle? Mm. And I mean, at some point, I'm not making money here. I am providing a lot of emergency care. It's eating into my resources as a hospital. I cannot afford a more big hospital, a more Nairobi hospital with three million. So at what point do I say I cannot? 
Okay. And why? And if I say I cannot, purely because I actually cannot afford this anymore, mm. am I liable? Yeah, so here's the thing, and, and one of the questions that Professor Magoha, who was then the chairperson of the medical board, asked um, Swift Medical uh, Ambulance, because they're the ones who were taking around Alex Madaga, was, you guys camped at Kenyatta from 11 a.m. up to 5 p.m. the next day when you couldn't find a bed. Why did you not just go to Nairobi Hospital? Everyone here comes from Nairobi, right? You know where Nairobi Hospital is. You know where Kenyatta is. So who can... I, I want to throw this back to you before I answer Dr. Ben's question. Why did they not go to Nairobi Hospital? Perception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The perception. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Aga Khan. By the way, they never tried Aga Khan. <laughs> <laughs> they did not try Aga Khan. Uh -huh. why, why is that? It's the perception. Okay, so it's your perception. Kind of reality. True. It's reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that... You go to a public facility, you have to pay before you receive services. Uh -huh. It's given. The advantage that KNH has is that they actually just will take patients, but um, at some point when you get to capacity, there's really nothing much they can do. And yeah. they cannot turn you away, per se. They'll just tell you, okay, we, we, can't, we, can't. we can't do it. Yes. So what you do now from there is up to you. Yeah. Right. Up to no. you, the ambulance. It is, it is up to you to be creative in terms of that. But you know you have an obligation. And, and the referral is not just from Kikuyu to Nairobi Women's. It was actually even for one of the, the reasons why uh, Kenyatta was held liable was for two things. Number one, even at the point where they camped in, inside uh, the, the ambulance, nobody bothered to come and check on them. Who, 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 so there is an obligation. You see, the, 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 when they when they kill, <laughs> they're not in the, they're not inside. So that's not our problem. They're not inside. That's not our problem. Listen. <laughs> you know, okay. Um, yes, he was. I'm going to yes. 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 So, yes. 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 K &H. Yes. But as you said, the referral policy doesn't really, it's not well adhered to, mm -hmm. if I can say so. Because guys will pick a patient, take them to a chemist, mm -hmm. where there's apparently a doctor, who will write on a small piece of paper to refer to KNH. Mm -hmm. But again, we know that referrals are meant to have levels, as yes. in you come from level exactly. 1 to level mm -hmm. 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah. that. But people do not care. I, I think it's because other facilities don't really do their part, so everyone is always like, Chuko you move on to Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. Now, they come to KNH. The thing is, at our accident emergency department, we have ventilators for ventilatory support for patients who require intubation. Yes. We have four. Mm. At any given time, mm. there's none that is free. They're of course. Full. full. Of course. So if this patient comes, and they come they outside the ambulance, the point is, they have not entered. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's why I want to correct you. So this is what on a stretcher to be yeah. brought in for us to mm. say, okay, yeah. this is our yes. patient. Yes. 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 So, so this can, is can where I, I want to yes, yes, yes. What I know Please introduce is that, yourself so, yes. uh, so that yeah, okay. we can actually know each other. <laughs> uh, my name is Lynn. I'm an emergency trained nurse. And what I know is that within 200 meters of your area of working, where your hospital is located, if anything happens to somebody, you are supposed to attend that patient. Mm -hmm. So long as it's 200 meters within, you are supposed to act on yeah. that patient. There's no, nothing yeah. like yeah. a yeah. yes. 300 yeah. meters. So even though it's over there at the gate, you will yes. attend, stabilize, yes. and then now use the referral. Yeah. Thank you. Because this is what, and this is what um, the medical board had an issue with. And I, and I feel that I've missed two policies here. There's an ambulance policy that we have in terms of just even the structure that an ambulance should look like. Yes. Have you all seen the yes. Machakos? The Machakos? Uh, <laughs> so, one of the things that, that the medical board in its judgment uh, was very concerned about was the quality of care that you're supposed to be given in an ambulance setting, and then number two, referral. Yes. Now, the, the illusion that people have is, yes, I will, I will write it. Uh, the illusion that people have, as, as he's saying, is uh, he's still in the ambulance. Mm. That obligation, when they got into the gate, that's your premises. You're, the, the, the person is actually under your care. 
your duty of care started at that point. Now, what the medical board had an issue with is the fact that the first time when Alex landed in Kenyatta, uh, there was the, 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 there was, uh, they, they noted very well that this person was not accompanied. So right from PCA, PCA Kikuyu, um, Alex was just com uh, accompanied by the ambulance staff. Nobody had been attached to them from PCA Kikuyu, which is supposed to happen when you're doing a referral. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mutua, yes. will Kenyatta ever give me a doctor to accompany me in an ambulance <laughs> at any but point? But you see, to is a level 6 facility. Yes. Yes. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, here's the thing. <laughs> and that's the question that was asked. When you know that your bed capacity, your 50, was it 57 or 59? I don't know how many beds you have now. Mm -hmm. That is full. What is your duty at that point? Our duty is to inform, okay, now given the precedence of all this that happened, yes. what now happens at our end is that yes. when a patient comes in and we cannot provide, a, uh, let's say, critical care for them, mm -hmm. this, these days now there's a form that they have to fill. We yes. explain to them that our capacity is full. Yes. But if you still insist on staying in KNH, what we will do, we'll do the best we can. We'll take you to our, our wards, we'll give you care. When an ICU bed becomes available, we will move you there. And there's a form that we fill and decide. Once they have done that, we do our part. But before what that, what stops you from referring to Nairobi Hospital? <laughs> because this is a question, and I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, okay. and, and the answer that Dr. Simon Monda, who was then in charge, gave me mm -hmm. was politics. That's all he said. He said, um, the, This board knows. In fact, he raised his hands, it, it was at a point of surrender, and he just said, this body knows the truth, <laughs> that we cannot refer. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> we cannot refer from uh, Kenyatta to another facility, especially a, a private facility. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that we need to honestly have a candid conversation here is about. You have Kenyatta that is surrounded by Coptic, Coptic Nairobi Hospital, Nairobi West. You're surrounded by other facilities, yet you are overwhelmed by the number of uh, patients that are coming. The second thing that had an issue with was, why are we referring to Kenyatta? Why are we referring to that? Like, are we shooting from a dispensary? To level. To, levels, uh, to, to the highest level. That's what, that's and and the depends. question again was, why? why what, 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 is, what, what are the, the, the gaps that are in between all these other levels of hospitals that have made it so desirable for everyone to say, I'm going to Kenyatta. I'm going to Kenyatta. So, um, look, we are not here to... How do I put this very diplomatically? Because I am on camera. <laughs> I'm, I am not here to, to punch holes and, and, and critique. I am here to critique. I'm here to critique the system. But I'm also here to recognize that we need solutions. And the solutions will have to come probably from all of you here in terms of there's a referral policy. There's a referral policy that is there. Yeah. Right? So there's a referral policy that is there, but it's not being adhered to. Yeah. Every single person knows that if I'm going to refer, I see Machakos ambulances coming from Machakos <laughs> to, <laughs> to Kenyatta, drop if the patient the there, oh. and then, leave. yeah, my obligation is done. I have yeah. dropped the patient. Number two, in terms of while we recognize that our facilities may be overwhelmed, what can we be able to do for the ambulances? Is there a way that ambulances can actually save lives? In terms of just how they're designed, because looking at the case study of Alex Madag, and I can tell you that case study for us is the one that has taught us everything. If they had to go back all the way to Kikuyu, to have an, a swap of the ambulances because the cylinders were just not compatible with what they were being given at Kenyatta. Is there a way that we can start designing our ambulances to an extent that they can be able to do so much of the stabilization that needs to happen, such that this patient can actually live inside this system in an ambulance while we're waiting for a bed to open up? But going back to your question, the money question. Mm. The money question is a true question because there's so many private facilities that are here and the, the conversation that we always have is that I'm here to make money. As a private facility, I have a duty, but at the same time, I'm in business just like any other shopkeeper out there.
Now, this is the distinction that comes in when it comes to emergency care. You can refuse to treat me for my headache. It's not an emergency. I can choose to go elsewhere. But when it comes to emergencies, and this is where I am, um, I'm going to you know, make that distinction, we're talking about an emergency. This person did not choose to collapse. This person could have, the, the, the difference with emergencies is that there's no choice. This person has been in an accident, and the nearest facility, thank you very much, um, the nearest facility to them is yours. Okay? Now, if you have a bed capacity of three, like Nairobi Women's Head, all Nairobi Women's had to do during the, the uh, preliminary inquiry that we had with the medical board is that they came with their chat and they showed, oh yeah, we have three beds, oh yeah, they were all full, so we had no capacity to take on any, one, any other person. But if you have a bed that is available, as was in Coptic, Coptic had a bed that was available, but for them, their requirement was fast foot, 200,000. And this is where they were faulted because now the preliminary inquiry found two hospitals out of the five liable, Kenyatta and Coptic. And for Coptic, their issue was, why did you require the 200,000? You could have made the distinction to say, your obligation is to take in the person, stabilize them. After stabilizing them, you can actually now refer them because it's a conversation to tell them, by the way, our hospital, we charge 200 per day. So please put a deposit. At that point, this patient is able to make a, a, a decision and tell you, actually, here is my insurance card, swipe it. And you swipe it and you continue living your best life. But at the point of you can't turn away this person based on the fact that you do not know whether they'll be able to pay. Because at that point, you have to save the life. So the ethical thing is, and the legal thing is, save the life first, and then after that, once this person has been stabilized, the, after the pre-stabilization has happened, then your duty is refer them to another facility where they are able to actually make the payment. So that's where the distinction comes in. You cannot use that as an excuse to say, I'm going to run out of business. That all I'm doing is just saving lives. <laughs> <laughs> You can't. It's, it's, a, it's unethical, it's illegal. At the point where this person needed the care, it was critical, golden hour. You can't negotiate at that point. But after they have stabilized, then you have a duty to ask them, are you able to pay? If you are, go and bring this, 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 this. And then at that point, the assumptions, there are many assumptions that are made that, number one, uh, a family member has been contacted or a next of kin has been contacted. And then now the discussions on payment can happen. But turning away this person at the point where they've been brought by a good Samaritan, that's unethical. And Maybe. that's that's where now the heated debate comes in. Maybe you can, money. a bit, just on this discussion, before you guys go into any insights from the other panelists yeah, yeah. on this, on this yeah. discussion up to this point. Yeah. Before you start on your own, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think on my part, uh, when it comes to payments, I think I'll cover it uh, when I'm talking about the policy because uh, that is one of the things it's uh, addressing. And also the referral strategy, maybe I can say something about it. Uh, yes. But the thing is, in terms of like for ambulances, because Brian, you've been in the ambulance service for a long time. I mean, there's an ambulance policy or ambulance standards that no one uses. But the, um, if the ambulance comes, for example, to Kenyatta, or okay, any hospital, Right. Um, and they refuse to accept the patient. What are you supposed to do with an ambulance? Okay, uh, it's a tough one because uh, now that comes down to agency protocols. If you look at the Kenya, uh, the Kenya ambulance standards from uh, Kenya Bureau of Standards, they do not have a guideline on what are you supposed to do. So it comes back to the agency. What does your agency say about it? For an agency that I used to work with, if you go to Kenyatta and they refuse to take the patient, what you do is you call back to the controller and you tell them, hey controller, they cannot take the patient. What do I do? So the controller has the option of looking for another facility which uh, they can direct you to, or uh, you'll have to come there until they take the patient. Because uh, as, as ambulance personnel, we are called emergency medical technicians, you know that you cannot abandon a patient. Abandonment is, a, is an offense. And abandonment is where you do not complete that chain of handing over. 
that you have a patient and either you do not uh, hand over that patient to a, a more qualified personnel or you leave that person without any further care. So you are not supposed to do that. So the only options you have is either you wait until, uh, until that facility is willing to take you in or you call the controller and try to find another facility who can be able to take you. There's a question, Tabitha, with uh, Kenyatta putting a doctor in there, but why should we put a doctor and Sorry, this is the for you. Yes. One why? of the things that uh, they were admonished for is actually uh, uh, allowing the patient to leave their facility unaccompanied. But why do they need to be accompanied? I mean, that's yeah. the whole idea of having an ambulance and service you know. and they're trained. So why is the nurse or doctor jumping into behind an ambulance? I think uh, for a long time we all understand that uh, emergency medical technicians have not been uh, recognized and uh, up to this point as we speak, they have not been recognized in the Kenyan health sector as professionals. And that goes without saying that, as I mentioned before, abandonment is when you hand over uh, your patient to someone who is not more qualified than you or uh, someone without a medical qualification and there these people in the, uh, this person is in a situation of emergency. So if a doctor hands over a patient to an emergency medical technician in their own belief, which is uh, not true, that uh, they are abandoning the patient. But ideally, emergency medical technicians have been in that class. I've gone for hospital rotations in Kenyatta, Mbagadi, Avenue Hospital, AAR. We do all those rotations, all that in intensive training, and some even go beyond the call of duty to undertake advanced life support courses. So these people are sufficiently qualified to take care of the patient and to manage the emergency needs, at least to support them during that whole chain of referral. So I think uh, what needs to be done is for doctors, nurses, and the other practitioners to recognize that these kind of professionals also have the specific kind of training that can be able to support life during that uh, transfer. Comments, questions? Could you just add something on... Uh the bit of uh, <coughs> Casey by <Badai. laughs> <laughs> For me, for me uh, things to do with the health uh, and, and the law, um, it's the awareness systemic issue. And uh, the problem with us is that uh, the way we deal with health has been what I call episodic. Today we wake up, uh, now we are on UHC. <laughs> uh, it's a big thing. Uh, until it becomes less sexy, then we move on to the next thing, uh, and so on and so forth. So we sort of don't have this wholesome conversation about, so what should the law say about health? Uh, what should be the role of the government? What should be the role of the, um, of the county governments, and so on and so forth. Now, one of the things that uh, the Health Act says is that, uh, the government has an obligation to create a fund for dealing with issues of emergency. And, and here is where I begin to fault. Uh, I don't know whether to fault or... Because one of the things I've, I've thought the medical profession could do is to engage uh, with the policy makers. Um, you know, they act like, oh, it's okay. And then later on, they come back and charge you guys as that team. Is there a is there a law that can protect the doctors and the nurses from the institution that they work in? Are you able to are you able to protect yourself from that? It goes down now to your employment relation, and uh, that was what night directing directing me to the employment act. Under the employment act, it is very specific that uh, there are some deductions that cannot be made by your employer. There is a list of deductions which can be made. And I'm very sure that uh, in the case where you taken care of a patient and uh, it was an emergency, which you are supposed to take care of as an emergency practitioner, you are not supposed to be charged for their, for their, for their course for medical treatment. Yes. I think that's a very good, I think you may need to share that with us, because I think there are many people who, who have are afraid to be charged. Yes. yes. Why? That one is uh, illegal and uh, something else I would like to add. It also happens that uh, 
after receiving that emergency treatment, some facilities that are an habit of uh, locking you in or detaining you and saying, oh, yes. you're not leaving until you pay or your relatives pay. Mm -hmm. But you see actually the law is very clear, it's saying that you cannot detain a patient for failure to pay this treatment. There are so many cases which have gone to court and the court has always found in favor of not detaining a patient. Yes. So if you have time, you can look up. There is an interesting case of Nathaniel Shimweni versus the Attorney General. It was uh, relating to Kenyatta. Another one in uh, Pumwani Hospital, another one in Nairobi Hospital. So as a facility, you are not allowed to detain a patient because they were not able to pay for the for their treatment. But I'm, I'm more keen to hear about anyone who has been deducted. Yes, yes. Not on camera. I'm encouraging you. I'm encouraging anyone who is here who has ever been deducted, or you have a colleague who, in a facility, yeah. has been deducted. Mm -hmm. I think these are the things that people need to speak out of. If that is what is deterring you yes. from offering emergency care because you're afraid that your salary is going to be touched, it's unethical to to deduct my salary because I offered my service on behalf of the facility that has a whole uh, <laughs> signboard saying welcome we admit and everything as a facility you cannot be deducted that's that's illegal mm. that's illegal and unethical on so many fronts but i now see where your fears are yes. that your you're going to goes. be deducted <laughs> your salary <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i don't know what what is the Practice. What what is uh, for, for those situations where salaries have been deducted? I've been interested in looking at the contract yeah. uh, and seeing exactly what it says, uh, because if there's such a clause, then that's quite uh, it's very legal. And yeah. It's not only just illegal, but it's also unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Because what it means is that uh, what the institution is doing is that it is penalizing you for doing what the law would actually expect you to do at that time. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So it has wider uh, systemic issues as well. So it's definitely not in the contract. Uh, it's not yeah. in the employment contract. But yes, uh, there, are, there are cases where yeah. people have wow. trust yeah. in um, So yeah, so I think we can maybe encourage anyone who has a case study to share that with uh, Dr. Ben. And we're more than happy to explore how we can actually go around it. And sometimes some of these things don't even need for us to go to court. Just highlight it to the media. <laughs> <laughs> that hospital facility will never, ever deduct someone's salary. But it's totally illegal. Okay. My name is uh, Dr. Kimadi Kyoga. I practice at uh, Meru Teaching and Referral Hospital. I want to talk, to talk more about uh, sexual violence yeah. because um, I've been encountered Back there, we feel P3 forms. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get in that post care rape thing, uh, mm -hmm. they test uh, for staffs, they look at the, whether the hymen is broken, mm -hmm. the HIV, urine infections, and everything. But then um, there are no injuries, no external injuries, and that this person is below 18 years. Mm -hmm. And um, they come after they realize they are pregnant and uh, they are usually forced by parents. So in that P3 form, they say examine genitalia, examine, examine, you get everything is normal. Of course, you won't find any sperms. Uh, maybe you get to see some infections, which does not directly translate to the rape. Yes, and then, uh, yes. How do you go about this case? All right. So let yes. me make a distinction when it is an emergency and when it is not an emergency. It is an emergency when they have come to you at the point where this person has been raped and then it's within that window period of 72 hours. That is where your first obligation is as a medical provider. And your obligations are now to do the, all the tests that you've talked about, give the emergent pill, give post-exposure prophylaxis if the patient has tested negative for HIV, give the STI prophylaxis ETC, fill in the post trip care form at that point, where they have brought themselves within that 72 hours. The biggest problem we have with sexual violence is that three quarters of the time, survivors will not present themselves within 72 hours. So at that point, your obligation is no longer, it's not an emergency. 
and what you're doing is actually filling in a form based on the observations you have. For someone to realize they're pregnant, that would be between six weeks to three months. Mm -hmm. Within six weeks, things have healed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the biggest, uh, the, the, the best example I've always uh, heard is from Dr. Shaffer who says, um, how the female genitalia is, is the same as just biting your tongue or your cheek. It heals within three days. So even within a week, you will not, there are things that you will not be able to, to, to see that would have be actually been seen at the point where this person came in immediately they had been raped. So Dr. Kyoga, just to answer you, your obligation is if this person comes within six hours of being raped, 12 hours of being raped, your, your heightened responsibility for emergency care is at that point. Now when they're coming to you and they're pregnant at six weeks, eight weeks, three months later, your obligation is just to, if they're um, coming in um, for filling in of the P3 form, you obviously you are under an obligation and ought to fill in based on your observations. And your observations at that point is, there's no injury. Yes. So if you cannot see an injury, you'll just fill in no injury. What perhaps you, um, I would encourage you to, to indicate is that patient came in six weeks after the rape. So that you're just indicating that this is not a fresh, a fresh case. So that the court is not making an assumption that this person was presented to you within 12 hours. But you're saying that in your medical history notes, you're indicating that a patient came to me uh, pregnant and the gestational period is eight weeks, 10 weeks, <coughs> so that if this evidence is going to be presented in court, then the court has the knowledge and benefit of knowing that this patient actually presented at 10 weeks. And therefore, it was impossible for you to actually have seen tears, anything that would have led to evidence being, uh, uh, any assumption being made that they were, they, they were raped at that point. And, and that's the difficulty we'll always find with a lot of survivors of sexual violence. They will not present immediately after the event happens. Most of them will present a week later, and that's where the difficulty comes in. So in that case, they're not going to get any justice in yeah. court? Because, yeah. yeah, yes, yeah. The, 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 that's one of the biggest challenges that we have with survivors of sexual violence, that justice is uh, compromised <coughs> because a post-rape care form will be filled six weeks later. And as I've said, try this at home. Bite your tongue. <laughs> and then, <laughs> see how, how, how quick it heals. Or even just at the side of the cheek. Within three days, it's healed. So someone who's presenting six weeks later, there's obviously very little you can do. And I'm not encouraging anyone to doctor evidence. If you did not observe it, don't note it down. And I know there's a temptation for a parent who will come back and say, but this doctor wrote on, on the form that they did not see. If you did not observe it, you can't write it. So that, that's the difficulty we have with sexual violence. But if they present within uh, the six hours, 12 hours, you have a, a whole guideline, guidelines on management of sexual violence that tell a provider what to do. And that's, that those are the things that I broke down to you. Test for pregnancy, test for HIV, uh, test for any STIs that are uh, de detectable. And then after that, now administer care, fill in the post-trip care form. Uh, right now, there is also um, filling in the P3 form if you're outside Nairobi. There's a circular that has been issued to say that P3 forms now will be filled by the, med the clinical providers in the hospitals. It's no longer going to be Dr. Shako at the Nairobi traffic area. So that's, that, that, that's your obligation in terms of that. But as I've said also, the difficulty comes in is the fact that there's also a lot that comes with just you offering the service. It's also test kits, reagents, drugs, they're not available most of the time. I think uh, I can also add something. When it comes to these matters of children, in case you are in doubt, uh, remember the 116. It's a toll free number yeah. by the Child Helpline Services. Just call them and they can guide you through all the steps. Right. So hold on to your questions. Uh, there's still more time for Q&A. We want to hear more now from Brian. Okay, so basically I'm going to tell you four things. Why, what is this policy? What does it have for you? Who is it for? And uh, what is the uh, next step? This policy started way back in 2012. That's when people started coming together and saying, hey, we need a policy on emergency medical care. 
And uh, in, during that time, it was about emergency medical services. Because emergency medical services, the people work in the pre setting. The guys work in the ambulances. These are the people who have not been recognized for a long time. And therefore, there was need for them to be supported and recognized in the dominant healthcare system. So over the years, there were symposia meetings and all that, and drafts were generated. Now, when you're making a policy, you have to do the initiation stage. That's where you come up with the idea and you get together the people. Then you have to do public uh, participation, where you, a team has to go around the counties, go to communities, and get feedback. What do you want in terms of emergency medical services in this country? So that was done. And uh, it now went to drafting stage where they were able now to put those thoughts into a book. A technical working group was formed where this team could now meet and uh, discuss on those issues, try to put them together. And after, so that was done. There was a stakeholders meeting. Now, for stakeholders, we normally have internal stakeholders meetings, external stakeholders meetings. All those were done, where most representatives are drawn from different uh, organizations. They come together and they give the input as you develop the document. Uh, then there came the expert review. I remember we were even with uh, Dr. Wahira in Mombasa. The expert review was done, and a team of experts now said, this is what we would like to see. And by then, it has now become the emergency medical care policy, because we recognized, as you know, the philosophy of Emergency Medicine Kenya Foundation is uh, that we want a whole healthcare system. We don't just want to look at doctors or nurses or EMTs. No, we want to look at the general healthcare system because when an emergency happens, it's not going to be about just one person. It is going to be about pulling everything together so that you can be able to handle that emergency. So stakeholders have given input and it has now become the emergency medical care policy. Of course, after that, uh, the next step which is required is now uh, endorsement. We are top officials from the government are supposed to now uh, put their signatures and say, Yes, now this document is uh, supposed to, you know, to have the force of law, if I may call it that. That was done, but there was a slight uh, challenge. Nowadays, we are moving away from having a policy just to have a beautiful document on the shelf. We need something which is actionable that if you pull that policy, if a layman gets that policy, they can be able to do something about it. Because not every person at the county level is in charge of health, for example, uh, maybe a, a doctor. Maybe that person was a policy maker or maybe a, a different kind of a professional. So we want any person, whether you are a healthcare practitioner, whether you are a lawyer, or whoever you are, uh, you can be able to implement this policy. So that policy, in short, was lacking on one thing the implementation plan. That is why, uh, again, I teammate to go uh, back to the drawing board. And uh, I can assure you that uh, after some time, the implementation plan was done. It was done particularly in Machakos. And uh, the next step after that was now for that policy now to be signed again because the initial signatures were withdrawn. So it has to be signed afresh and uh, now for it to be launched to the public for use. Why did I tell you all this? That number one, uh, initially you had heard that it was supposed to be launched when the initial signatures were appended. Whenever such a document is signed, then it becomes an actionable document. It becomes like now a legal instrument. But now those uh, signatures were withdrawn at that point because it was lacking the implementation plan. So at this point, as we speak, it is not a document that you can refer to. But the reason why uh, I'm going to tell you what it contains is because in a, maybe a few weeks, a few weeks, it stop, is going to be <laughs> <laughs> I'm not raising I'm not raising your hope or something because it's something that I may have uh, some information about. So in a very short while, the document will be out. And it is important for us to know what does it contain for us. So who is this document for? This document is started out as a document for emergency medical technicians and paramedics, but today it is not just about emergency medical technicians. It's about everyone in emergency care. It's about the doctors and how, how, how you're going to operate. It's about the nurses, the clinic officers, 
and all these cadres who are dealing with emergency care, including emergency medical technicians. So what does this contain? It basically covers all the pillars of the healthcare system. We normally say that the healthcare system has various pillars like human resources. So it gives us strategic directions on what do we want for human resources in emergency care, the personnel who are working here. Those who don't have a curricula, can they be developed? Those who don't have schemes of service, can they be developed? Because currently we have emergency care nurses. Any emergency care nurses in the house? Mm -hmm. Exactly, you're here. So are you recognized, uh, let's say, by the nursing council? or uh, which is, yeah, which is your subscribing <laughs> body? Which is your subscribing body? What is your curriculum? Is it universal? So those are the things which are to be looked at at all levels of emergency care service delivery. So the personnel, those who don't have schemes of service, to get it. Those who don't have curricula, to have it. Also, it's important to know that um, in developing this, we considered a parliamentary reso uh, resolution. In 2015, Dr. Susan Musioka from um, Machakos went to Parliament and said that uh, we need even community responders to be trained in the basics of emergency care. We need all medical personnel to be trained in emergency care. So that also was embedded in the document that now we expect that when it is launched, then we'll have a very wide cross-section of people being trained in emergency care. Then uh, it also talks about leadership and governance. And I think that is the biggest thing or the biggest win in that document. It is creating an emergency medical uh, care council which is going now to deal with all aspects of uh, emergency medical care and drive that policy forward. It talks about uh, the infrastructure, for example. What do you want to see in case of ambulances? Someone talked about ambulances. What do you want to see in those ambulances? How are they supposed to be looking? What are the guidelines to guide them? You understand that we have the Kenya Bureau of, uh, of Standards. We have a Kenya standard. The initial one was a Kenya standard 24, uh, 2419 of 2013. But that standard, it was gazetted in 2013. Ideally, when it is gazetted, then it means it has this force of law and uh, people are supposed to adhere to it and all that. But the problem that we have in Kenya is that uh, people don't want to be proactive. People don't want to find what are the standards guiding us and how can we implement them. So that document, over the five years, very few organizations even uh, attempted to see what's happening. So the term of the document came to an end. It was reviewed, and uh, recently, on uh, 4th of April 2019, they released a new version, the second edition of that uh, standard. Again, the biggest challenge is that uh, it is, yes, it's issued by CAPS, but it is on sale. 4,471 shillings and 20 cents. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so if you don't have such kind of money, then uh, you can't access the document. But briefly, the document tells you about uh, the ambulances, the types of ambulance, type A, B, C, uh, then we have the classifications. If it's A, we have A1, A, uh, the type 2s, and all that. It also tells you about branding. How is an ambulance supposed to be branded? What is the size of ambulance? Because uh, I've seen uh, a very small... Uh, Kenyans are complaining and asking, wait a minute, is this even an ambulance? The truth is, the law is very clear on how an ambulance is supposed to be even in terms of size. Yes, we recognize that there have to be big ones, small ones, and that's why you have the types of ambulances. Yeah? So that also has to be considered. It also talks about the equipment which are supposed to be inside. What are the bare minimums? For example, can you have an ambulance without oxygen in it? Can you have an ambulance without a defibrillator in it? Can you have an ambulance without a suction unit in it? So it is going to tell you the basics for every type of ambulance. What are the basic contents that must mean that kind of an ambulance? And also uh, the other stuff. Now, that is in terms of infrastructure. We are also going to talk about the policy also covers things like communication. How are we going to integrate uh, healthcare information? That when someone is sitting in an ambulance, they can be able to relay this information to the hospital and in advance, the person on the other side will know that there is an ambulance unit coming in, they have a patient with maybe a polytrauma, uh, maybe uh, fractures to the legs, or uh, a person who has uh, been electrocuted, the intervention that the ambulance personnel have already given. So that by the time you get there, 
the healthcare practitioner in the receiving facility, you have sufficient information to immediately act on this person. So that kind of integrating health information. We want to talk about things like, for example, a short cut. How many people are struggling to find an ambulance for an ambu uh, contact for an ambulance? During that emergency, and maybe your phone is not with you, you might find it as a challenge. So can we have a short cut? And uh, it's good to know that 999 is working, uh, but uh, we need now a short cut which is dedicated to emergencies. Again, those are some of the things that the government uh, wants in terms of emergency care. It also talks about the other components, for example, financing, which we've talked about. Under the Health Act, Section 15 is saying, hey, the Minister of Health is supposed to put together this fund. That in case of emergency, then payments can be made from that fund. For those people who are saying that they are private uh, facilities who are asking me in business, how can we do this? The only thing the Health Act is qualifying, they are saying that uh, if you have the ability to provide, but they are not telling you how do you know that a facility has the ability to provide emergency care or not. So in that case, this policy now talks about can we have this council coming up with guidelines on uh, how this fund can be utilized in order to sort out those cases of emergency. Plus there are so many other components. So that is uh, in brief, what the emergency medical care policy has uh, asked for the emergency care sector in Kenya. And I can tell you that it is very promising. And uh, once it is launched and uh, taken up, then it is something with very good, uh, some, yeah, very good intentions for Kenya. Then another thing which is related is the Kenya referral strategy and guidelines. The same story that uh, in Kenya we don't want to be proactive and uh, implement these things. The referral strategy was issued, uh, was it in 2014? And uh, since then, the, I know dissemination was only done in 22 counties. Now, dissemination is just a team, going, a team that was involved in developing the document going to, let's say, counties or areas and telling them, hey, this is a summary of the referral strategy, this is how we can be able to implement it. And it, it has nothing to do with the validity of the document. When the document is signed, and launched, then it is valid. So you find that uh, the account is, for example, if the team never reached there, then uh, they have no idea about our referral strategy in Kenya. You know? yeah. And these documents, it's a public document, it's not on sale. They just have to go to the Minister of Health uh, website and check what are the new guidelines which are there, and you get uh, to have a look at it. So the term again ended because every document has its own term. Most of them, they have terms. So the term ended. The new one has not been, uh, uh, it, the renewal process has not started. But uh, we hope that the renewal process will start in uh, the near future. But basically, the referral strategy, for those who are interested, because we touched just on emergency care, it talks about the key pillars. For example, how do we move specimens? Sometimes you don't have to call an ambulance just to transport a patient. Maybe you just want to take a blood sample to German Medical Center, or to another facility for it to be analyzed in a lab and sent back. It talks about uh, expertise movement, that sometimes how do we refer medical uh, practitioners from one facility to another. <coughs> it also talks about things like client movement, now patients. <coughs> and uh, I cannot go to patients because uh, Tabitha has talked about it, and uh, what is the current practice. That the current practice is that uh, if you're the facility with the patient, that is the referring facility, you are supposed to accompany that patient with a, a medical practitioner, the nurse, a doctor, depending on your needs. Now, that is what it says. Personally, I know the challenges that we have, that sometimes in the facilities, you don't have enough personnel to spare and go on the right. We all know that emergency medical technicians, these people are well-trained and well-qualified. You should see them even when they are doing their drills. These people come to your facilities during the attachment. Some of these people are working in different uh, emergency departments in this country. They are well qualified. And their only mistake is because the government has not said, hey, we now recognize you as health professionals. The question is, is a health professional, the person that the government says you are a health pro uh, professional, or is this someone who has the skills, who has been well trained, the standards are there and everything else, and we is able to know what to do when an emergency happens and save that life. 
because if you're only going to say that, it's until the government says that now you're professionals. Just that proclamation, then uh, I don't. But I hope because that's one of the things that the policy is addressing, once the policy is out, then that can be addressed. Questions, comments? Who wants to verify if they are provoked? Is that the specific? Like, why is kept? That's the thing. If it's you don't get them for free. It's just that the websites nowadays things are easier to get, but the price is also quite restrictive. Four thousand is too high. I mean, we buy laws for about two hundred. <laughs> but that's the average price we pay for just buying a hard copy of a of a of a law. But four thousand four hundred and what and twenty and twenty cents. And twenty cents I think that is a bit punitive. Yes. However, I have known Kenyans to be very creative. Yes. We can buy one piece and photocopy yes. and yes. help yes. each other here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm saying I have known Kenyans to be creative. I have not seen <laughs> I would not say that will be done. <laughs> no, but I, I think that's a bit punitive. And uh, and also on the standards, it's also it's uh, cheaper for people who subscribe. For example, for those who normally uh, get different uh, standards from Kev, if you subscribe, then uh, you ask is almost half the price. So. so we are, we if you're interested in that, in that <laughs> standard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, I mean, the case, it's not just about the ambulance standards, only the yeah. ambulance that you see moving. It also has standards for air ambulances, the guys who are doing medical evacuations. So any AMREP guys in the house? <laughs> okay, it has standards for water ambulances. There are guys with boats and they say this is an ambulance, so there are such standards. It has standards for emergency medical services operators, the drivers. So it's no longer the time when you used to get your friend from the village and say, hey, I have a job for you in Nairobi, can and drive that ambulance. We have a standard, it's those guys who are driving the ambulances. What are you supposed to be having? Yeah. So it's not about anyone who can drive an ambulance. But again, all these standards, just go and Google uh, emergency services on the CAPS web store, and you'll be able to see all the uh, standards which are related to emergency care. Uh, she had a question. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Dr. Natasha. I work uh, in Makwene County. Uh, you talked about ambulances. Uh, my, uh, I'm not, it's not really a question, but a comment. Eh? For us in Mashinani, our referrals are really interfered with by politicians. In fact, uh, should I say, you know, and a lot of us are admonished for, for una figure as soon as we have an emergency. So I don't know what, what can protect us because those are the fights we have every day and it really affects uh, our referral. I think at that one, what most agencies are doing, including the agencies that I used to work for, is that you have SOP, standard operating procedures, on that ambulance. The standard operating procedures are the ones which are going to say what is an emergency, what is not an emergency. When an emergency happens, uh, how are you supposed to you know, dispatch the ambulance? After you dispatch it, how is it going to come back and all that? So the standard operating procedures, they cover the whole cycle of ambulance response from the time it is dispatched to the time it comes back. But does the law define what is an emergency? Yeah. The health yeah. act defines an emergency, what an emergency is. And it's not just the health act, it's a variety of documents, including all these policies. They have a definition of what an emergency is. Now, what it doesn't do is list them. So anyone here who has ever seen the Public Health Act, at the back of the Public Health Act, it actually gives you what we used to call the contagious diseases, mm -hmm. and it tells you black fever and I don't know what. Now for emergencies, it doesn't list them. It doesn't, it just gives you the definition. Is somebody's life in danger? Are they at the risk of dying? Um, you know, th th that's the, the parameters it gives you. But it leaves it as your prerogative as the doctor to say, this person is having an, a heart attack. This woman has an ectopic pregnancy. So it doesn't list for you and tell you that this is the 10 things that are an emergency. But it defines it. So long as it is a life-threatening condition, 
whereby there are more chances of this person dying than living, then it is an emergency. Uh, but I hear your struggles. I, I, I know that there are instances where uh, matters that may not necessarily be an emergency, uh, you'll get a call from somebody who, who is you know, in a political office to tell you that this should be prioritized. Um, I have no solution to put this question. <laughs> 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 so you're saying to guide my SOPs, uh, are documents I can use? Yes, if you have a SOPs, uh, for example, if you have a EMT in your county, emergency medical technicians know their whole set set, they can be able to put together something, and uh, whenever you tell them, Mwishimiwa, that uh, I'm sorry, I cannot be able to release the ambulance, you have something to base your decision on, exactly. that it is based on the, the SOPs that we have, and they have been approved by the county uh, executive for health. That is your way out. Yes, please. Uh, I have a question on the ambulance. Yes. So, um, the, when, does, is the patient or the relative supposed to remove pain before they get the ambulance service? Then, um, the other thing with regard to that is some counties are worked in Kericho County. So, as it was, the hospital was basically at the board of Kericho in Bomet County. So, we get patients. Then, uh, if a patient from Bomet County wants you know, a referral, the ambulance will be provided for them. But if the patient is not from Bomet County, they are not given. You know, they, and they have to pay, or they are, they are told the ambulance is not available at this time. Are there any rules, you know, or any way that we should know that uh, this patient, an ambulance can be provided for this patient and best for it? Uh, thank you so much. So uh, the first one I'll cover whether who is supposed to to pay the cost. The first thing is uh, in case of emergencies. Uh, especially road traffic uh, accidents and uh, such kind of emergencies, then uh, no one is supposed to pay. No one is supposed to pay, even if you call a private ambulance service provider. All ambulance service providers know that. So whenever you make that call, you just tell them, uh, witness an accident or there is a building which has collapsed or someone has been hit, and that uh, they'll come and pick that person without asking you to pay anything. Now, in, this ca in the case of any other emergencies, for example, you are calling from home and uh, you have abdominal pains or uh, any kind of emergencies from home, those ones then are the person who is receiving your call. We call them emergency medical dispatchers. Mm -hmm. They are going to ask you, okay, are you in a position to pay? Now, depending on, again on the agency protocols, depending on the organization that you call, they have protocols. They'll get to refer. If they have to charge you, then they'll tell you, depending on the distance, this is the amount you're supposed to pay. If you cannot be able to pay that, then they can either consult and are allowed to pick you or not. Now, that comes down to agency protocols. But what I know, there are emergencies which occur out here, then you are not supposed to be charged anything. Now, in terms of emergencies which occur near the border, now that comes back to administration, and the counties need to do what we call mutual assistance agreements that the leaders from the two counties come to sit together and say, hey, let's have a light kind of an agreement that in case of an emergency from your side, we can lift. In case of an emergency from your side, we can lift. And in terms of compensation, if any is supposed to be done, then this is the procedure that we're going to settle down. So that comes down to agreement between the two counties. So that means if there's an accident, I can just call the ambulance until it comes. Yes. But, but they always ask. No. For accidents, if you tell them it's an accident out here, no one is going to ask you who is going to pay. You see, that is the reason why most Kenyans don't want to call an ambulance when they witness an accident, because they think you'll be asked to pay. Yeah. But you are not supposed to, to pay. Yes. Just explain that it is an emergency that you've witnessed, and you will not be asked to pay. should put a billboard with that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, any other questions? Okay, i comment about an yes. ambulance. Eh? Yes. Peter, I work in a private hospital, yes. and uh, you know there are those policies and um, which govern the institution. Yes. When you are called for this road traffic accident just outside the, some few meters from the hospital, you have to call your boss. You have to be given a consent to the call. So you, we are still tight like now your boss says you, you know we are man making institution. <laughs> what what will you end up doing? Is it not respect? I mean, the accident is just here in between us. 
Pakistan and have been so St. John's of the week from Nairobi, from town, they've come to a spot visit for St. John's. Even I think the public knows St. John's, they are more <laughs> to serve public ladder than Akina Avenue and, and Pisha. In yeah. fact, they tell you, ah, I'm sure they call ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are more tired rather than even when we work in this private ministry, you feel that when that call comes, yeah. it's not ours. So, is that ambulance level by law? Because you see, they say the law, if you deny to provide emergency, whatever, yeah. then your lab will have to pay million. So if an ambulance does not, that is best to the accident, as you say, refuses to respond, is it liable and they were called? Yes, they are liable. Now, when you look at the law, there are things we have like a legitimate expectation, especially when it comes to uh, the emergency service providers. A legitimate expectation, it means that the public have an expectation that uh, you provide this kind of service. And when an emergency happens, then you are supposed to provide this service. If you don't provide that service and you, are, you have the capacity to provide it, then that will be a problem. Yes. Yeah, so, and, uh, sorry. Yeah. and uh, administrative, you see that, uh, like for example, getting permission, that comes down to administrative, uh, to administrative uh, inconveniences. Administrative inconveniences, in my opinion, should not come in the way of uh, providing emergency care. All you have to do is now to advise, because you've been trained, you have to advise uh, your organization that this is the current practice, that in, ca in case of these emergencies, then this is what you are supposed to do so that you align your SOPs. Personally, the organization that I used to work for, there was a time that you had to seek an approval before you make that response. And when we went for our staff meetings, we said, hey, this is the practice. And after explaining that, the organization was like, okay, if that is the practice, then we had to align our SOPs. And whenever an emergency happens, you just have to do response, provided you document it. You have your call logs, you document, you said there was an emergency at this time, at this time you responded and all that. That is what is required. So even if you're a private service provider, again, remember even now the Health Act is saying, even a private facility, you have that obligation to provide emergency care. That response, that is emergency, part of emergency care. Because if you look at the definition of pre-hospital care in Section 7 of the Health Act, it is included in that. If you refuse, you will be liable. Uh, more of a comment. I think what I've picked from the discussion is just two things. Um, the finances aspect, which kind of is coupled with politics, and also now the communication aspect in terms of even referral or even just general communication to the general public about what they need to expect in terms of emergency medicine. Now, um, I have a question on that. Uh, in dealing with emergency situations is that there's something, I think we'll call it like pre-consent for treatment. And in an emergency case, you won't start waiting for someone to give you consent to do certain things. And there are some things which, if they're life-saving, you have to do them. Now, uh, does the Health Act, does it have a, a, a specific area where it actually protects the healthcare givers in terms of, if I actually decide to give a, do a procedure on a patient and actually set them in an emergency situation, I will not be held liable, let's say, if that patient passes on, or if the outcome is not what was expected. As you know, a relatives really expect that if a patient is taken to a particular hospital, they expect full recovery. But things go wrong. As you know, things go wrong. And let's say in our part we did what we could, but the expectation of what the the relatives wanted is not the same. So they can actually say, you know, we did not give consent for one, two, three, four to be done. Is there something on that that actually protects the healthcare the healthcare givers so that we are able now to do the best that we can to save this life and knowing that yes. There are risks to it. There are other outcomes that can, can occur. Is there something that can actually protect the people who actually give this emergency care? Especially even just for even EMTs when they're picking up patients by the roadside. Yes. Because I think you know, in the US they have something called the Good Samaritan Law. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not, you cannot be sued if you actually try to help someone who was actually at an accident scene. Is there something like that in the, in the policy that you have discussed that can actually be used? All right, so let, I'll, I'll start it off and then I'll, I'll, I'll let... Um, uh, uh, Peter and uh, Maurice also top up. So there's nothing specific in the Health Act that talks about emergency medical treatment and informed consent. I just that. I will sh we'll show the Health Act just now at the end of this call. Uh -huh. It actually just says uh, the rights and duties of the healthcare provider That's shall include. Is that uh, section 12? This is section, there's section 9. Mm -hmm. 
Section 9 says no specified health service may be provided to a patient without the patient's informed consent unless no party be here. I think the patient is being treated for an emergency situation. Right. Mm. The health okay. Yeah. Now, I want to make uh, a few clarifications on informed consent. The, the general tactics in informed consent <coughs> is that you cannot start treating someone in this conversation without telling them what you're treating them for, what uh, the side effects would be, etc. Right? We understand mm. informed consent. Yeah. No, I don't think you do because half of the doctors, all the cases that they have, <laughs> are doctors who have not um, indicated to people what they're either going to be doing or they go ahead and sterilize a woman without telling her that this is the reason why we sterilized you or removed your <laughs> communication. <laughs> but in emergency care, there are certain assumptions that are made, and for, for doctors in particular, your professional code of conduct. Also, the ethics and code of conduct also is very specific on many assumptions that are made of goodwill and duty of care. There is an assumption that is made that by the time you're making a decision to drill a hole in someone's throat, that it was the only option that you had and that it was the only thing that you could have done to save that person's life. So if this person, for instance, comes back and sues you and says that I think you could have just inserted a needle in me and that my life would have been perfect, it's up to you now to demonstrate to the medical board or the court that look, at the point where I received this patient, they were bleeding or they had a cracked skull, and that the only care that I could have given to stop the bleeding was to tie this ETC, whatever care that they have sued you for. So the assumptions that are made generally in terms of taught, the law of tort, that there is a duty of care that you had as a medical provider, and you did it to the best of your ability. So it's up to you to demonstrate to the court that I did this to the best of my ability. The amputating this person's leg was the only way we could have stopped the bleeding from happening. I don't know. I'm just assuming yes. things. I'm giving an example here. I don't think amputating is that. But I'm, I'm making an assumption that if this person has sued you for amputating their leg, it is up to you to show the court that, look, at this point, this person was unconscious. Right? So there was no chance of me getting informed consent. There was no conversation that could have happened. So you're demonstrating to the court that this person was unconscious. As a doctor, I am aware that when a case as this is presented before me, then the only thing that needs to be done immediately to stop the bleeding is ETC. So you're demonstrating that you did the, the duty of care that you have and you did it to the best of your knowledge. So at that point then, the question of informed consent is, is, is uh, taken away. But if this person, uh, person is awake, I always encourage that if this person is conscious, is awake, is alive, it also doesn't hurt for you to tell them what you're doing to them. Right? They may, they may refuse for you to give, they, they may actually sometimes refuse to even give consent. Uh, we've had instances where somebody has said, no, I don't, I don't believe in blood transfusion. Right? Yes. You've had those difficult cases yes. of, of people whose religious beliefs have, have actually barred them from receiving blood. And, and then at that point, I have seen, especially with Kenyatta, they have a waiver form, yes. where, which they make the, uh, the patient sign to say that we have informed you that you have, you, you, if, if you continue with this, um, the best case that was in Kenyatta was a lady from uh, Dadaab camp. She had come in, she does not speak a word of English. She had come in with her husband and her mother. She had a pregnancy that was uh, nine months, uh, had a cardiac issue, she was severely anemic, and the first baby, the twins, uh, she was pregnant with twins. The first twin was in breach. And they had to give her a cesarean uh, section, and she refused. So Kenyatta ran to the high court. And, and they, they, they were like, please God, we want you to compel this woman to go through a cesarean section because there was absolutely the, no chance that the, 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 this woman would actually survive. And by the time that happened, time was of the essence, when this is an emergency, um, this lady just refused and her husband refused to give consent and her mother refused to give consent. So what Kenyatta did, because even for certificate of urgencies in, in the high court, you'll have to wait maybe in the afternoon to argue it out for you to be given this, this case. The lady wanted to walk out, so they made her sign a waiver to say that we have informed you that you will die. 
and you have taken our advice and you have acted against it and you have uh, you're waiving um, liability such that if anything happens to you you will not come back to blame the facility so it's a practice that I've also seen especially where the patient is con uh, conscious but if they're not conscious at that point it will just have to be you demonstrating to the to the medical board or any other court that you did this to the best of your ability that you knew that you have a duty of care to the person and that this was the only thing only emergency uh, treatment that could have been given to them to save their life so that that's where you draw the line with informed consent if i could just add on, uh, on consent uh, uh, the general rule really is that the consent must be obtained that is the, the, the bottom line uh, but as uh, but uh, Rashida was reading, there are exceptions, especially if the patient is unconscious, um, obviously they can't give consent, and there's no other relative to give consent. It's an emergency situation and whatnot. And uh, the life of the patient uh, needs to be saved. So consent uh, is, uh, is, is a basic minimum. It has, it has, to, it has to be given, uh, basically. And it must be informed consent. Simply. I really, really informed emphasize consent. on informed consent, because uh, informed consent means that you've given someone all the options. You've told them that this is, this is what we want to do to you. We are doing this to you because of X, Y, and Z in terms of the diagnosis. The side effects that you should expect from this are X, Y, and Z. So you're giving them, and then you're telling them, if, if you don't want to go through this, uh, these other options, these are the other options that you have. So you're not just giving them what you think is best for them, but you're giving them the wide range of medical services that they can, options that they can have, and then let them be the ones to pick. And that's why we've seen people who have refused chemo and have said, I want to uh, die with the dignity that I have, and I don't want to go through hair loss and, and my skin turning. You've, you've seen instances like that. One guy, but the case was the perfect example for that. Give the choices. Let the person then decide what they want. I think that's very important. That the pros and cons and side effects side and, and other options. So yes. That's any consent, yeah. any informed consent. Yeah. Uh, you have a question. There's a question online. Um, does verbal consent survive or must it be written even in an emergency situation? I think in emergencies, I think we have to go maybe even with a verbal consent. Uh, because at the point where you're dealing with em emergencies, the, the sensitivity with emergencies is that it's not the same with everything else. Mm. Um, you're trying to save a life. So you're trying to minimize harm, minimize the damage that will be done to this person. So if, for instance, they're likely to get into an epileptic attack or a convulsion, you don't have a chance to go and run to admin where all the waivers and papers are picked, and maybe the admin person has gone for lunch, and they have locked that cabinet, <laughs> then to come back and tell this person, please sign here. And even sometimes the ability to sign may not be there because this person may actually now be in that state of, of mind that even signing, capacity to even hold a, a, a pen uh, may be lacking. So sometimes we may get that. I will always encourage if there's another person who is a witness, because this person may have, have been brought by mm -hmm. a, a, a guardian, a relative, a good Samaritan, then the verbal consent will suffice if there's also a witness is also able to say, Nilisikia Akisema, I heard them say that go ahead and take me to theater. Yeah. Right. Um, there are no hard and fast rules when yeah. it comes to emergencies. I, the, I, I don't think we can be able to just say that um, with this one, you have to get a written consent because at that point, the emergency may be so dire that you actually just need to rush this person to theater. All right. Uh, I know we all have burning questions. I want Moise to give a quick whatever, then we'll just have quick fire questions after that to the end. Yes. Okay, um, I, I think uh, I should be congratulated because I taught her. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so she really has, uh, I think, something that this guy has discovered. Uh, I, I need to revisit my, my marks. <laughs> <laughs> my graduation. You can apply. <laughs> Uh, I think for me, uh, just uh, four, four short uh, interventions. One is that uh, I know we've talked about the law in terms of uh, what the law says, 
what are the obligations of uh, you know a practitioner in terms of uh, emergency medical uh, treatments. Uh, but there's one aspect that um, I usually like to point out. Uh, it is in the what is it called? The Medical Practitioners Identities Act, um, Section 20. Uh, conduct that is uh, and professional conduct. Uh, disgraceful conduct in a professional uh, manner that and I've said that uh, I've argued that uh, failure to provide uh, emergency medical treatment when uh, it is required and you have the ability and whatnot uh, can actually amount to professional misconduct under section 20 of the Medical Practitioners and Dentist Act. Uh, we have not made that decision yet here in Kenya, but in other jurisdictions, uh, it has been held that if you are aware that someone is uh, in need of you know, uh, emergency medical intervention, and you know, for one reason or another you, you choose uh, not to, then uh, I think uh, it could be a disciplinary issue. So something just to, to keep at the back of our, of our minds. Uh, the second intervention I wanted to make uh, basically has to do with the EMC policy. Uh, there's a lot of politics in, in these things. Uh, and sometimes uh, a good strategy would be to you know, just get a feel of what uh, the persons who are in charge of the ministry you know, think about all these things and so on. Because sometimes you follow the formal process and then it reaches somewhere. Uh, like the last time it was supposed to be launched, it was just a small you know, we political hitch and what not <laughs> and so on. Uh, but what I don't know is, uh, perhaps uh, Brian will, will tell us here, is uh, I don't know how far the cabinet itself has been involved. Uh, maybe that's something you would want to think about. Because what I know is that the practice is that uh, for policy to reach a point where it becomes a, a formal document, then it has to be adapted by cabinet. And then those are, you know, some of but perhaps that is something you you want to talk about. Uh, the third intervention uh, that I have basically has to do with this, this entire debate about health in Kenya. I think we've had a very unhealthy debate uh, about health. Um, we've had tensions. On the one hand, we have, we have the profession, uh, you know, agitating for certain things. And on the other hand, we've had uh, the government sticking to certain positions and saying, you know, we are the bosses, we are the guys who say what happens and what not. And we all remember what happened a few years back. And uh, my argument has been since the, the industrial actions and what not, uh, we've had this very tense uh, relationship between, you know, medical professionals uh, and public officials, which does not augur well. Uh, for, for the population. So, and, and I've always urged that perhaps what we need is some sort of, you know, debrief, you know, between the practitioners themselves and the government. Let us just sit down and uh, let's start from scratch. Let us start from scratch. Because if you look at this whole aspect of, uh, you know, if they keep telling us we've devolved health and whatnot. Uh, sometimes when you go to the county and you tell them we want these things, they tell you no, but that is the function of the national government. If you go to the national government, they tell you no, that is a function of uh, the county government and whatnot. Uh, and I think there is sort of, there's a sense in which we are not talking with each other, we are talking at each other and so on. So one of the things I have urged, perhaps the profession and the leadership, and the work, um, let us find a way in which we can sit uh, basically as a community and rethink health because the way it is now uh, it's a mess let me just give an example uh, forget about the issue of devolution and whatnot right now the minister appointed um, what is it this called an acting uh, something uh, you know the director of medical services now no longer exists General. Director, director General. General. Now the Director General. There's someone else who's been appointed. Uh, the, this gentleman, what's his name? The former DMS, what's his name? Uh, uh, Jackson Kyoko. Now he's acting. Uh, 
the Kenya, Kenya uh, Oversight Professional Oversight Authority. Authority acting. On the ground, what has happened is that that authority has been moved to the uh, to the former premises to the premises of uh, the Medical Practitioners and Dentists Board. The board is under the authority. Are they going to operate? So is there anyone else apart from the medical board? Is the nursing council under this authority, the clinical officers? Yeah, those are professions, so they come under the health oversight uh, professional authority and so on and so on. And, and, and that's why I'm saying that uh, we've had a very unhealthy, uh, sometimes the minister wakes up and she makes whatever appointments and so on. So you can imagine what kind of discussion is going to happen. Now what, what is happening now is uh, there's actually just link of physical space at, at, at the board. A building that was set up for the board. So who is going to direct who and, and, and what and so on. So, so we have those kinds, and, and, and I've said that, uh, why don't we just start from scratch? You know, so that even if we're talking about issues about the Health Service Commission, let's start from scratch and bring all these issues uh, on the table, and we restructure. And I've said that uh, the only way we'll even deal with issues about emergency medical treatment, the policies and whatnot is when we have we sit down and we have a very sober discussion uh, about all these issues. I don't know where whether we have reached uh, that level. Uh, my final intervention has to be about strategies. Uh, we are all interested in. I think we are all interested in. in, in, in as medical professionals, uh, we've taken the oath. You know, we're saving lives and, and all that. Um, but we're also interested in working in environments where you know we feel that we are being effective and we are not being overused uh, or even abused and so on. Because you can't expect me as a, as, as a health professional to provide the best of my ability, but you're not giving me all the facilities that, 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 uh, that I need. Uh, and so, as a profession, I think uh, one of the things that perhaps you want to do is to think about what are the strategies uh, going forward. We have all these laws, we have all these gaps, we have the draft policy, uh, and, and so on and so forth. In order to ensure that we as professionals uh, work in an atmosphere where we feel that we are being effective, and that uh, we are also not being, uh, what, we are not being required to do more than what we can, we need to think about strategies. Uh, one of the things, perhaps, that you may want to think about is uh, how do you engage the policy makers? Uh, sometimes it takes more than just talking about saying, you know, the law says this, the law says that, and so on. As, as the policy debate has shown us, there's a lot of politics in all of these things. So sometimes you have to think outside uh, just to your uh, you know, area of operation and see uh, how else you can engage these people. Um, there are other strategies, for example, would you want, for example, to litigate some issues, for instance? Uh, for me, if I am a private healthcare provider, and the state is telling me I have an obligation to provide uh, emergency medical treatment, and yet I am spending my resources, um, I've put up Nairobi Hospital, billions of shillings and whatnot. Uh, if I do my list and see, um, what, how much money I use per patient, you know, in terms of providing what the state is, oblig is obligating me to do, then I should ask the question, why shouldn't the state be compelled to compensate me? Because what is happening uh, is that the state is forcing me to use my private resources to provide what, in fact, is a public good. In law, that would be unconstitutional. So there are quite a number of issues that... Uh, you know, we, we may want to think about moving forward, uh, perhaps, and, and just get the court to, you know, give uh, some interpretation uh, and so on. Oh, Tata is there. And Tabi is also here. Yes. Uh, and I'm also here. So. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and very finally, I think. Um, I don't know what the medical practitioners and dentists board, I don't know whether there's any, I don't know what their work is. 
Personally, I've had, uh, I've had serious problems with them uh, because uh, I think, well, here is a confession. Uh, my wife is a doctor. So for me, this is, it is selfish. Uh, you know, the, you know, you pay the licensing fees and whatnot. 20,000. 20,000, yeah. yeah. You know, I could use that money to pay fees. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so, the, and, and so what, what do they do for the profession? Uh, I think, and I think we, we need to begin to have those uh, kinds of conversations. And uh, by the way, if you look critically at the law, and I've argued that that 20,000 that you pay, if you're working in a public institution, really, you shouldn't pay it. It is illegal. Talk to me later. It's not. <laughs> a lot of legal discussions. I'm sure. Yes. 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 So, because I'm sure everyone has a question. Uh, all those legal questions working in the emergency care, I have a turn, so we'll let you guys go first. Yes, hands up. Yes, you have a question. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Gladys. I work in an emergency department. I was just wondering about consent and this discharge against medical advice. So, who protects the children? Because sometimes you'll have a child who comes in and they need that care, but the parents will not give you consent, and they are the ones who are supposed to sign on behalf of the kids. So what happens to the children? Okay, so let's quickly discuss consent generally, not in an emergency care. Um, as we said, it's, it's easier for a grown-up because uh, you talk to them, they'll, you'll tell them that the things that they need, they'll tell you yes or no. For children, the law is, there's uh, many assumptions that are made. Number one, that a child is not capable of giving consent generally. And that's why children... It, a, a child is defined to be any person between 0 to 18, right? Under the Children's <laughs> Act. So there's an assumption that is made in law that children are not able to give their own consent. Generally, not just for medical uh, procedures, but for everything else. And that's why children are not allowed to take ba loans from the banks, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Banks they, other things. <laughs> banks other things. <laughs> All right? Now, there are, however, exemptions. In instances where children in law are allowed to be the ones to make decisions for themselves. So, for instance, the HIV Prevention and Control Act, uh, I think under Section 14, talks about instances where a child may test for HIV on their own volition without the consent of their parent. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. So, if a child is uh, pregnant, if a child is already married, and if a child is of risky behavior that would lead them to, uh, to a situation where the doctor would assess that they may get uh, HIV. So for instance, if a child who is a sex worker uh, under the age of 18, if we have such a child, there's an assumption in law that they can make their own decision to get an HIV test. All right? Now, there's also something called the best interest of the child in law which means that sometimes a parent may make a decision that may not be in the best interest of the child. So a parent may refuse for a child to get a vaccine, but it is in the best interest of the child to get the vaccine. At that point, the law may interfere and compel the, the parent to give the consent or may go ahead and vaccinate the child without the consent of the parent. Now, the danger with emergencies, as I said, say for instance a child has come in, this child is unaccompanied, right? Uh, it's a road traffic accident. Uh, some children, it's maybe somewhere in Salga, and uh, maybe some, some people were taken to Nakuru, others were brought to Nairobi, and the child was separated from the parent in that accident. And the medical provider at that point to be the one to, uh, to, 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 to verify and assess what is in the best interest of the child. So because this, this, this in, in this instance, there's no parent, there's no guardian, you can't wait. There's no time to wait. So at that point, it is an assessment of the best interest of the child. What is in the best interest of the child? Now, there are certain hospitals that have actually made it a policy that if a child has to go to theater and they're accompanied, it is the supervisor of the facility that has to sign. 
for that child. I don't know if you know of any facility like that. Um, I know that when Nakuru were trying to make their Maternal Newborn Child Health Act, the first draft, they had indicated that it would be the CEC. The county CEC, county executive committee member to be the one to sign. How many times are these people ever around for them to be signing on to, uh, to this? So we, we changed that for them and we told them it's impossible for you to put a law that makes the minister of the county the one to come and sign for every operation that a child has to go for. So most pro hospitals, the procedure for most hospitals is the chief medical officer or the one in charge of the facility is the one that uh, is made to sign. And if they're not available, there's always somebody who's designated to do that. So the, look at wh whatever, whichever facility you're in, but in terms of emergency medical treatment, I cannot uh, emphasize this more. Consent will be based on what is the best interest of the child at that point? Is it to take them to theater? Are they choking? Are they gagging? Are they unconscious? So you cannot wait for a parent to come and make a decision at that point. And sometimes even if the parent makes a decision that is contra, you just record it and indicate that they did not give consent for us to go to theater. However, in my interest as a medical professional, remember you're a professional. In my, in my view and in my medical assessment as a doctor, this child needed magnesium to stop that epileptic attack, right? So you're not going to say that uh, a parent insisted that you put a spoon and wait out for the for the uh, for the convulsions to happen. <laughs> there are many doctors here, but please, <laughs> I, I, you don't want to broken limbs. Yeah, but. It's up to you, look, as a professional, it's, it's you weighing the, the circumstances and saying that I looked at this situation, the child had been, uh, this epileptic attack had been happening, or these convulsions had been happening for more than five minutes. What was I going to do? I'm, I'm not going to wait because the parent has insisted that what we do in our house is we put the spoon and wait for the convulsion to, to, to run out, right? So if you're going to administer something, you administer it. But also, I always recommend that put it on paper afterwards. I know half of you don't have that time to do it. Because you're just like, even recording something, oh God, that has already passed. Put, always put it up on paper. Medical history notes have saved people in terms of, I've had instances where a doctor has been accused, but they go back to the medical history, the, 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 the medical notes that they did, the documentation that they did after they administered the, the drug to say, I did this and I recorded, and I did 20 milligrams or whatever micrograms, and, and they record it down. So that can, can protect you later on if there's a lawsuit that comes up. But the best interest of the child and your own professional assessment is what we will look at first in the first instance. Good. And I, I, yes. I think we've had cases of this, uh, I don't know if you've had those, those are a religion, uh, it's called nursing? They're called uh, Kabunokia, somewhere in Ukambani, yeah. mm. where they say um, the child will never be taken to hospital. You know, it's uh, <laughs> Jesus who heals and whatever and so on. So when the child is sick, they're not going to be vaccinated. Uh, what the government has done, they just arrest the parents mm. and they charge them. You know, and the child is, is, is vaccinated, is treated, and so on and so forth. Uh, in situations which are not of an emergency. <laughs> Uh, later. The other thing that uh, perhaps you that may be of interest to you is that in, in that in the context of practice, um, there's something that is known as the evolving capacity of the child. Yes. Um, so that if you look at the child, are they a, a person who understands the consequences of the decisions that they make? Mm -hmm. If you're able to assess that objectively, you know, by asking them questions and whatnot. Uh, sometimes it is possible to allow them to be the ones to, uh, to make that determination. Because remember that the definition of a child, um, in some sense, is actually technical. Because what is the difference between a 17-year-old, 17 and uh, 6 months old, and an 18 years old? I mean, the 18 years old is 18 and 1 day old is an adult, by law, technically. But the 17 and 6 months old is a child. But in terms of their capacities, what is the difference? So, so again, uh, you are allowed to assess at that particular point and determine whether or not they can give consent under those circumstances. 
Uh, I think uh, something else I need to add uh, is the uh, one we have not talked about, and that is for persons with disability. Yes. Most of the time, a uh, person will come into your facility and you'll say, ah, this person has come was him, was insane, so, and uh, you have to force treatment on this person and all that. And uh, just to be aware that uh, right now, the current practice is that even persons with disability, including mental disability, have rights, and they have, they have to give consent. So that is provided under Section 5 and 12 of the Convention on Persons with Disability. And that convention, a long time ago, it used to be just a nice document. But nowadays, I know even Kenyan cases where people have gone to court on the basis of that document and uh, gotten a favorable judgment. So even that person whom you think is insane, when they come to the facility, the first thing, don't assume. Try to see if you can get consent. And if you have a relative nearby or someone who can be able to back you up, the better. But never assume. Just on that one, yes. I mean, someone who is... I think he said that there's a medic medically, there's a <coughs> psychotic, okay? Or, <coughs> yes, not, patient, yes, there we go. Patients <laughs> with mental health issues um, and uh, drug cuts. I mean, are they, can they conscientiously give consent? I mean, is that consent legal? A long time ago, we used to say that these people cannot give consent. <laughs> and therefore, the basis of treatment used to be involuntary treatment, mm -hmm. but this person, uh, by basis of, uh, by, by then we used to say unsound mind, which is, we yes. don't say it at all, it is persons with mental disability, <laughs> normally say that these people cannot give consent, mm -hmm. but that was then and things have changed. Now we are saying that even these people, they have been recognized as persons, and among other rights they have, are the right to give consent. And also you have to look at, there are various documents which normally say that you cannot uh, do medical experimentation or give medical treatment without someone's consent. So when uh, usually these things come in handy when you're on the other side of the, in court, when you're on the other side, and that, that is when these things get real. For, for intoxication, the, I think the general uh, assumption is that you can't give mm -hmm. consent when you're intoxicated. Mm -hmm. But for persons with uh, uh, mental uh, disability, there's, there's also an assumption of they, are, they, they also have, po what are they called, points of lucid moments? Yeah, lucid, yeah. lucid moments. So even with, um, this one has always been more defined in writing of a will. Even somebody who has mental capacity, there's an assumption in, uh, when somebody challenges that in court and says, oh, but this person did not have the capacity. There's an assumption that uh, you can be able to demonstrate to the court that they had a lucid moment where they actually recognized who they were, what they are in life, how many children I have, how much property I have, how I want it distributed. There's, there's, there's those elements that, that come out of that. But for intoxication, drunken, uh, whatever, uh, there's an assumption generally that you're incapable of making a decision when you're drunk. So we will wait it out. We'll wait out for you to be sober, and then we'll ask you, do you still want to have a vasectomy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now we can take you in there. Any other questions? Yes. yes. How, how, how do you expect someone with hallucinations, yeah. let's say auditory visual, to give you proper consent? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, you come down now to the lucid moments. Yes. Lucid moments are basically the times when you think someone is able to understand, understand themselves. Yes. They normally have those periods. So if someone is within that period, then uh, it's good to try and get consent. But if they are deep into that mental state that they cannot be able to understand you or uh, be able to give any constructive feedback, then that one now you have to uh, do what is best in their circumstances. And remember also, it depends on uh, what are you treating. Is it an emergency situation or is yeah. it something that can wait, can wait. You know, for you to be able to get the consent? And I'm sure you appreciate that uh, for those of you who are involved in policy making, the mental health is actually under amendment right now. Yeah. And a lot of changes are going to happen, including isolation of, of, of persons, uh, this and thing of training, yeah. exactly. The, a lot is going to change because of the appreciation that, um, you know, it's that that's not how we should be treating people. Yeah.
Actually, even the persons with disabilities act is yes. also in the process of changing because of those uh, emerging issues yeah. and how persons with disability need to be treated. I just, as you get lawyer, say ignorance of the law is no defense. There we go. Right. I have a question. Oh, thank you, Dr. Ashir. Unfortunately, I sat behind the moderator. <laughs> 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 I have two burning questions, but I'm glad that you are telling me. My name is Ostas. Yeah. I work for Centric Air Ambulance. Okay. So I'm an emergency supply person. Yeah. I have two burning questions, but one is fully answered. I had actually written down the three populations, consent in children, mental health, and patients with all that level of consciousness. That's fully covered. Uh, I would like to take us back to the conversation on uh, the policy, the emergency care policy. Uh, in regards to staffing and the company of staff. I'd like to weigh in into what Dr. Oshira had asked initially, considering that uh, the practical situation in Kenya is that you may never have an opportunity where you have enough staff to actually send the company the patient. They are, they are, they are you'd say, better, of, better placed hospitals where the staffing is better. It's not three patients to one nurse at least two patients to one nurse, it's hard to find a situation where it's one nurse to one patient all through in any facility. It's even the best staff private hospitals in Kenya. Why not, when we're still developing the emergency care policy, streamline and standardize the staffing? Because the issue here is uh, consistency of care in between transfers. You're moving a critically ill patient from one hospital, intubated, mechanically ventilated from hospital A to hospital B, why not standardize, from the policy point of view, the quality of care in the ambulances and define the least level of training, the least level of skill, the least level of knowledge that that ambulance attendant, whoever is the EMS personnel taking care of that patient, has to a level where there will be no interruptions in care from one hospital to the other. It's either the same level of training, between the hospital, at least a level that allows you to offer equivalent care in transit from one level, from one hospital to the other. And that goes to, including Dr. Ashila, Ashila because you're part of the policy developers. <laughs> I, I think uh, that, is a, that is a very good and constructive feedback. It's something that needs to be looked at. But um, number one, just to clarify a few things. The, the thing on uh, the person in the ambulance. That one is not in the emergency care policy. The policy is generally a broad document because right now we are saying that the Ministry of Health, for example, at the national level is supposed to make policies. But these policies, uh, the law also says that when you look at the constitution on dividing bank functions, it's saying that uh, the county governments are going to implement these ones. Now the rationale was that we need to make broad statements so that counties have to, uh, when they're implementing, they have to now come up with the smaller, the smaller details and guidelines to fill it in. Number two, we also have the Emergency Medical Care Council, which is established, and their work is now going to be developing those guidelines. So for now, it is not in the policy because it will be so much to put into the policy. In terms of the level of care to be provided in the ambulances, currently the pre care providers, they are sufficiently trained. Number two, the ambulance standards, they also talk about staffing. I mentioned about a different standard for operators, but for personnel who are going to work inside the ambulance and doing patient support services, there is a standard on their qualification and the number of people actually are going to be in. It will be interesting for you to look at, um, at that uh, standard and see what it provides. But I agree that uh, we need to look at how to maintain that level of uh, care uh, from the receiving facility, during transport, uh, sorry, from the transferring facility, during transport, and to the receiving uh, facility. Yeah. But just on that, I mean, the policy was not able to capture all the nitty gritty, but Brian has correctly said it has broad statements, but I think the formation of the council then would be mandated to write all the small details and govern the whole, because it's a big field. It's all the way from pre hospital into the hospital, all those emergency care fund problems. So all of that will be addressed with the formation of the council. So hopefully that will be addressed by the policy. All right, questions? Yes. Um, in cases whereby you have um, an emergency, um, you know, in our Kenyan societies, we have 
relatives coming in and this one wants to make the decision. Uh, the brother of the patient wants to make a decision. The wife of the patient wants to make a decision. And, and you know, there's that power of the attorney um, uh, um, right. Who do you follow in this instance? Is it the wife? Is it the parents? Is it the, the agent? How do you go about such a situation? Let's say you are already in an active resuscitation and all these people are around. Um, do you want to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. uh, we remember, I don't know how many of us remember Terry Shiavo, the Terry Shiavo case. This lady, it, it was a big uh, case in the US. Uh, she went into, into a coma, she went into a permanent limitative state. Uh, the husband, now she was just, you know, connected to the machine. Uh, technically or um, functionally, she was dead, but she was alive simply because of the machine. She was, you know, hooked up into all those nodes and whatnot and whatnot. So the husband reached a point where he said, "I don't want her to be on this machine anymore." So he gave that consent, and the doctors were just about to switch it off. But then the parents went to court and they got an injunction. And there was a fight, there was a fight, there was a fight. Eventually, uh, I think it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the court said no. Uh, the, the next best person to make this decision is the spouse. Uh, because by law, is the legal uh, representative at that point. So, there's a, there's a certain assumption that the court, that the law makes in terms of uh, who can make decisions uh, best with, in relation to any other particular person, for example, if it's a patient and whatnot. And there's a so-called, there's something known as a degree of consanguinity. Who is next uh, close to that person by law? Uh, generally speaking, if it's a spouse, if it's a, a husband who's in the, in the, in the, in the, on the bed, the spouse generally will be the one who uh, will be taken as, as, as the next of kin and uh, perhaps the the next best person to be the legal representative. It is something that we use in the, in the law of inheritance, um, and, and it can also be imported under these circumstances. So, wife, husband, husband, wife, child, parent. Um, and, 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 that, and that degree, as you go on, unless now there is something in the nature of, say, uh, a power of women, for example, to override that is something, or even a court order uh, that gives custody to you know of that person to another particular person. Otherwise, generally, we want to use that uh, that degree of consanguinity to determine uh, who is the best person to make that decision. I have a couple of questions. So, child abuse. So, I think this child is being abused. Me as the emergency care provider, what's my legal obligation? Second, same on domestic abuse, and also on rape. Uh, am I liable to, to have to report these cases? Um, if I don't report, am I liable? Mm -hmm. um, yes. All right. I'll, I'll take that one. How many of you heard about this story that made the headlines recently of a lawyer who went to test his children for uh, HIV and then the next day the big headlines was that he was raping his children? Mm -hmm. yes. And I hope you, you ultimately found out the truth that he wasn't children. raping his children and that one of the, the little, um, the children that he had taken from his brother, he had suspected that his brother died of, out of HIV. So because he didn't want these children, he wanted to go and get them tested to find out. But because he didn't want the kids to be asking, so why are we the only ones being tested? He took his children and the other children and a whole caravan to, to get tested. But when they got to the hospital, uh, what happened is that the nurses were like, why is this person testing children for HIV? Call the police! <laughs> and and uh, the whole scandal was now that he was raping the children. Okay? You have a duty and an obligation, not only to that child, but also in law, to make sure that if there is a crime that is being committed, you are actually not part of either aiding that, that, that crime. If you suspect, and I've had this with um, 
survivors of uh, domestic violence, instances where we've also trained medics to, 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 to identify that this woman may not necessarily be telling you that she's a victim of domestic violence, but when you look at her bruises and the story that the spouse is telling, there's an inconsistency. I've had an instance where I think, was it in Garissa, where the, the medic was actually very creative to tell the, 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 the husband, we need you out of the room for just a few minutes because we want to do a private test. Because the husband was insistent on just being there while the woman was being treated. And at that point when they got just a private moment is when the woman said, I need you to save me. If I leave here, he's going to kill me. So you have a duty to your patient, not to their husband, not to the children. It is to your patient. And the moment you um, um, are being brought a survivor of sexual violence, and all you're doing is filling the peace reform without asking the other questions because you were trained in medical school, filling the peace reform, that is your duty. But you're not asking where did it happen, when did it happen, have you called for the police, do you need assistance? Sometimes you just need to even ask these questions for you to elicit some of the other things that may not necessarily be in a bruise. So as good doctors who are not careless with their patients, I really encourage for anyone who comes to you, especially for sexual violence, domestic abuse, find out more. What you can do and are you able to help this person report. Your duty in law is to make sure that you present this evidence in court when you're called because you're going to be the expert witness, right? So you're going to be called to present your post rep care form and to say that when I did the assessment of this person, uh, these are the things that I was able to record. But it's also important for you, especially when the victim is not telling you, and I'm using those two words interchangeably because of the fact that sometimes this person will not tell you that they are going through domestic abuse. They'll just come and tell you, I banged my, my face on the wall. And then you're like, ah. <laughs> the, the, the edge of, when you do your calculations, and they're trying to tell you that I fell, and I fell on the table, and you're like, how low is the table? The table is here. How could you have fallen? Something is not adding up. It is not careless of you to ask. I really encourage, just ask for more details, and you could actually be able to help with um, making sure that this person actually gets do you report it to the policy, you individually as the healthcare provider? Why not? Yes. Why, why not? Uh, it's a crime. <laughs> it's, a, it's a crime that is happening. It's a crime that's happening. And it's no domestic violence is out order, right? So there's a crime that is happening and it is your duty. So for instance, in that instance, I still don't fault the nurse who panicked when these children were being tested for HIV. Because for her, she wanted to protect the children. She may not have known the story, but for her she panicked because when you come to test young children and you're not giving me the full story, she panicked and called the police. And I still don't fault her because I'd rather that we clear it after you've gone to the police Rather than, I let you go scot-free, and yet there's a child who is being violated, and all I'm doing is treating this child, treating this child. You're actually aiding you in, the, in the commission of the crime. In fact, I'll take it further. If, if you are a professional, a medical professional, and you are seeing, for example, you are consistently you know, attending to this child, and, and you're noticing their things, objectively you can, you can tell that something is not right, and then you don't take the next step to try and prevent this from recurring, if that child came to me and asked me what can I do, I suppose this doctor is concerned, I will sue you in negligence. Mm -hmm. And I will give them negligence. Negligence or malpractice? Negligence. Negligence. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. even malpractice. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, another one. So, uh, okay, one more than me. Uh, a couple come for HIV testing. And they're happy initially when they're coming, but then come back for the results independently for some whatever reason. <laughs> one is positive, one is negative. And then <laughs> and let's say the husband is insisting on knowing the wife's results. Should you should, they came together initially. But initially when, when they you could have come with your whole community <laughs> to test. 
the obligation under the HIV Prevention and Control Act is very clear. Kila mtu na results Have you guys had, I mean, there's so many uh, cases that uh, you can refer to. Uh, Karen Hospital, a lady goes in, she is consistently sick, um, uh, gets uh, to test, the doctor uh, recommends that, hey, let's, let's test you for a couple of other things. And one of the things that they, they decide to do is after they draw blood, they get creative and they decide to test for HIV, right? Now, the doctor decides that after the results are out, the results are positive that she's HIV positive. And they decide that, oh, I don't think she's strong enough to handle her own results. So what do you do? They call the spouse. <laughs> And then this lady was paying by insurance, and then they also notified the, the insurance company that this lady's results are indicative that she's HIV positive. I will tell, verily, verily, I will tell you what the court decided, the HIV tribunal. You have no business as a medical provider giving somebody else's results, especially for HIV. And all of us appreciate, number one, the circumstances in which we as a country have come from when it comes to HIV. The 90s stigma. Do you remember the billboards, mm -hmm. right? Ukimui now are the big ones with the skeletons. So the stigma that has been there is what people have been trying. We're, we're trying as a society to fight that. Number two, the the duty of care you owe is to your patient. Who is your patient? And this is a question that you need to be asking yourself every time you have somebody in the room. It's not the husband who is your patient. Your duty of care is to your patient, and the patient is the person who tested for HIV. Did they give consent to test in the first place? If you're good enough for that, then the results are owed to them. All right? Do they need to Please do not. Yes. yes. You cannot test somebody for HIV. Well, you've drawn blood for, or you want to test their blood count, and then you decide, now that I already have a sample, <laughs> <laughs> now that I already have the blood, why am I not just test for everything else? Yeah. That's illegal. You cannot test for HIV without the consent before drawing the blood. And if you draw blood for um, for anemia or if you want to test for white blood cells or whatever else you can test in the blood, you cannot use that sample then to get creative and say, I already have some extra blood here. Why don't I test for HIV? Consent is important. Informed consent, very, 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 very important, especially for HIV. So the, the, the HIV tribunal has awarded uh, 2.5 million for against Karen Hospital, and recently it awarded, I think, uh, it was also, uh, is it 1.5 million against Nairobi Women's for disclosing someone's HIV test to the insurance company? Because Nairobi Women's were arguing as a hospital that we have a contract with Resolution Health, that whenever we do the whole body test, uh, we owe a duty of care to Resolution to share the results with them. No. Your duty of care is to your patient, not to the insurance firm that is paying you. And, and the court was very clear on this. So when it comes to HIV, you could have come with the entire congregation, a, a whole bus to test, mm -hmm. but the duty of care is to you and your patient. The results are that patient's results. Not their spouse, not their children, not their father, not even their mother. So please... For HIV, it's a very sensitive topic that when we discuss, we always encourage people, please, get consent, which is freely given, specific for HIV, so don't get creative. And then after that, the results, the, um, the, the results are owed to the patient. There's an exemption, however, uh, both in the HIV Prevention and Control Act, as well as the East Africa HIV Prevention and Management Act. There are instances where you may be allowed to share the results of somebody with a third party. But those exemptions are very few, very few, and they might even include a court order, where there's a court order that is required. One of the things that we've always, uh, uh, again, include, uh, indicated, HIV is not, uh, when you compare it to what, like a public health outbreak like Ebola. You're not dealing with something that, if, if you don't share these results with the rest of the world, something will happen to this person, no. We, we now know better. You know, the 90s, there was less information around HIV, HIV transmission, and, and, and conversations around how to deal with it. Right now, we know very well that there's no transmission that can happen. It's not like an outbreak that I'm going to infect the entire room with it. So there's no emergency 
for you to share this information with a spouse, with children, with their parents, etc. Unless there is a certain concern. Now, these ones have very been, uh, uh, been very unique. Uh, we had a case of um, somebody who had threatened that they would go out and spread the disease. And therefore, the question then was, should we alert somebody else, a third party? Should you alert a third party um, on, on this person's HIV uh, status? But the exemptions are fewer than the general rule. The general rule is somebody's results are theirs, and it is how they handle it. So it is not your obligation to start calling anybody else for, for their, their Two HIV last results. questions. Just to be quick and quick My quick answers now will be yes or no. <laughs> you are attending to the patient, you treat yourself. You want to know whether the patient is HIV positive. Do I get her consent to them? And if the patient says no, what's the noise? You, look, your freaking yourself is very different from this person, right? Um, this, for, for instance, the national guidelines on management of sexual violence indicate uh, that if you fear that you have exposed yourself, you test yourself, and then you immediately put on post exposure prophylaxis yourself. It has nothing to do with this person's HIV status, whether they are positive or not. So that says no. <laughs> yes. If you feel that you're exposed, put yourself on post exposure prophylaxis. I, I think even for people in surgery and, and everything, that's yeah. the standard of care. You don't start drawing blood from this person who is on the table and you're like, let me first test whether they're positive so that I put myself on care. There is hospital policies. <laughs> that you <laughs> test this person who is on yeah. the theater. Yes. 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 In hospitals <laughs> where we work, there are those hospital policies. You must test this patient. You're but testing with their this patient consent. to verify with their consent. With their consent. With their consent. Yes. To, to verify that you have been exposed. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. You want to go, uh, uh, let's say you've had a little stick injury. Yeah. The procedure is, there's a certain procedure whereby, of course, you report yourself and then what you have just said happens. Yes. You get tested and then after that you're put on PEP. Yeah. But also on the other hand, the patient has to be informed that ABCD has happened and we'd also like to test you. Do exactly. you agree or don't you? Yes. But that doesn't stop you from getting into your PEP. Yes, yes. So but that's the procedure. But you have to get contact yeah, and the I could patient refuse. to be tested. I could refuse. And, and yeah. for me, my biggest issue is when I'm on the operating table, uh, what consent are you getting? But I know of a couple of you here. Deep skin. <laughs> <laughs> this person will never know. <laughs> now with, so the, with, the, with the advancement and technology of self-testing kids, yeah. a lot of potential violations are happening. And we've been very quick to also want people to say that, please, self-testing kids, are not for you to test your spouse when they're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> you find it funny right now, but wait until you see it. I'm sure you have a question. They are there. They are there. Yes. 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 But as, as she says, she yes. clearly puts it, you, it doesn't stop you from putting yourself on pep. But if you feel that you also want to tell the patient that, look, I have exposed myself, and I want to just get to know if you're uh, HIV positive or not, and this person could say no. It's, it's, up, it's up to them. Yeah, it doesn't stop you from being put on post exposure prophylaxis. They have become a quack. Yes. <laughs> Question. Uh, my name is Gerard. I wanted to ask about evidence preservation. Eh? Mm -hmm. I don't know whether forensics are strict in Kenya about, let's say, if it's a rape case, uh, you've done your evidence preservation. Uh, do you get, can I be sued for getting in the way? And also use your photographs. Because I've, I've seen it in articles. You can use photographs. Is it being practiced in Kenya? Have you? Yeah, we, we got an amendment to the Evidence Act, uh, which now gives the uh, conditions for, for how to use a photograph, who can use a photograph, who can present a photograph as evidence in court, and that they must certify and um, be able to say that I'm the one who took the original photograph. So I, forwards, what's up forwards? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has to be a photo that you took yourself. Yes. Uh, then you, if it's... With consent, I'm guessing. Of course. <laughs> uh, and 
then you have to, if you're downloading it, then you download it and then you print it. And then you have to sign a certificate that's, that yes. gives, uh, basically step by step, I took a photo, I was using mm. Samsung, yes. uh, what is this, S7, mm. then I went to a computer, I turned it on, I downloaded, the computer was Lenovo, yes. <laughs> the model X, X, Y, Z, and so on, then I downloaded it, then I printed it, the printer was model X, X, S, Y, and so on, and now this is the photograph and I'm presenting it, and then you sign. And the physical evidence, like clothes and all that. Yeah, all those can be used. They can be used there. Yeah. Yeah. What, what did you mean by tampering with evidence? I didn't understand if, what you said. What can I get like you, in the If way? you collected the evidence, I'm guessing you collected yes. the evidence, but... You stored it in the wrong way. Like in fact, chain of custody, actually, because oh, yeah. that's one of the questions yeah. we have issues with. For, for especially <coughs> for, for rape cases, mm. one of the biggest problems that we have yeah. is chain of custody. Mm. Mm. I have personally, when I worked at FIDA, been in a police station where they were using the bed sheet that had been the rape where, where it had happened. They were using it to protect themselves from sunlight. Now, the, yes, it was a curtain. Now it had become a curtain with, with with all the evidence there because number one, the biggest challenges that we have with chain of custody is collection of the, evi uh, the, the evidence. Government chemist Baduni Ule Ule Moja in Kenya, and then also. Uh, police officers do not have lockers in Kenya where they keep back. By the way, it is their duty to collect. So if you go to MSF Kibra right now, their fridges are full like this. And they keep telling us one of the biggest things that they don't know what to do is they have evidence that has been there for more than a year. And it has never been collected back by the police. Because at the post rep care form, right at the top, uh, sorry, bottom right corner, there's a place where the investigating officer has to sign when he collects the evidence from the facility. So um, uh, Medicine on Frontier will keep the, the, the evidence. If the girl, for instance, came with clothes, nini, they are all collected and stored very well. And then the investigating officer has to pick them. When he picks them, he signs. But the biggest problem that we have is that they don't have lockers to keep this. So what happens is that this same police officer today was an investigating officer for a rape case. Tomorrow he's assigned to go and do beat and patrol. Uko, Nairobi University, where they're going on strike. <laughs> he has left the evidence. But because they don't have storage for this evidence, what happens is that a lot of times evidence is compromised. Evidence is compromised. And as defense lawyers, this is where we thrive. Because we will come and beyond reasonable doubt, we will hammer that evidence to show that it was tampered. The chain of custody was broken. When this person got it, and then we ask, okay, so you got it from Moyale. How did it get to Nairobi? Or for instance, it was collected there, and then it's coming for testing in, uh, in the government chemist Nairobi. How was it transported? We put it in a modern coast, modern <laughs> coast bus. Ukabatia nani? Conductor. It's already tampered. It's already tampered. Because how, how was it moved from that place to this other place? If I can be able to demonstrate as the defense lawyer that you put it there, the conductor, it got there, it was, it was not even picked by the police officer from Baska. It was picked, you sent a taxi driver to come, chain of custody broken. So that, that is the biggest problem that we have with, especially sexual violence cases. The chain of custody is never maintained. It's never a clean one. Um, there is a bill that is being currently drafted by Honorable Gadoni Wamushoba. I don't know how many of us know about it. The, uh, it's called Safe uh, Forensic Evidence and Rape Kits, an introduction in, into Parliament where she wants to introduce a better system of tracking uh, evidence to do with especially sexual violence. Uh, where there will be rape kits, these rape kits will have a tracking number, this tracking number will have barcodes and scan, whatever they call chips. Mm. And then it will be tracked where it is. You can actually literally see. So the evidence right now is with the government chemist. You put the number, okay, it has gone back to the police officer. But this, the, the entire system, it's not just the police, it's the an, an entire system of collection of evidence. Right from who took it, how many months can they keep it, how, what is their capacity, do they have a fridge, do they have a freezer, um, how much? Uh, how many years can we store this evidence? Uh, when will the case go to court? 
I, a case will take five years by the time the medic comes. That that nini was destroyed three years ago. That is the best right. So the yes. chain of custody is still shaking. Mm -hmm. Quick, okay. quick ones. Yeah. Right. Just no, no, I'm sorry, she's living. Yes. Oh, yes, okay. Uh -huh. okay. My question is uh, I'll take you back to the HIV for the children who are born positive to COVID. Mm -hmm. And they have to wait for They only discover when they're like 18 and then they're like, what? I'm positive. Yeah. Or when they're going to boarding schools and then their parents have packed the, the ARV drugs and then they get to the uh, you know, inspection and then the teacher is like, oh, women were ARVs. <laughs> That's how they discover yeah. that they are positive. All right. Yeah. Well, good. Another question? The one at the back. Yes. Yeah, my question is, according to medical ethics, HIV and AIDS is that uh, the best approach to deal with HIV and AIDS 
is when you protect the rights of those who are deemed to be uh, you know, suffering from it and so on. Uh, so that even when it comes to the situation where I think uh, a spouse um, or a partner is you know, HIV positive, uh, the best reaction really is not to think that you owe that other party uh, some duty, you know. The best approach is to work with a person who is HIV positive and you work with them towards the point where they are enabled to disclose to the other person that uh, this is the position. And they are also, uh, you know, informed that it is not a good thing to deliberately expose the other person. Uh, remember that... Uh, when we passed this legislation, because I worked on the I worked on the draft long, long time ago when I was still a student, we had said that um, deliberate infection, yeah. you know, by one person or another, is a criminal offence. The other day, that has been declared unconstitutional. You cannot charge someone uh, for it, it. Cannot be a criminal offence to deliberately infect another person. Uh, yes, the court has said that is unconstitutional. Uh, so we look for other ways of dealing with these things. We should not, uh, shouldn't be a major reaction, uh, especially when it comes to HIV. I think I can also add that uh, since most medics have undergone a medical ethics club, it's also good to know that not everything that is ethical is legal. And uh, when it comes down to it, the court will focus more on the law rather than what you think is right or wrong. Right. I think that's a good point. Sorry, yes. <laughs> ethics, yes. ethics thing. I, my experience is this, that uh, I don't know how they do it at the University of Nairobi. At Moore University, at the point when they are graduating, on the eve of the graduation, they call in someone to talk to the students about ethics. And I think that's it's a big problem. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it should be part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. A unit that is examinable. Uh, let's talk about the law. Talk about the ethics, yes. And what not, and let's talk about uh, the legal issues. And I think this is where you can even bring in issues about obligations in so far as emergency medical treatment is concerned, uh, issues about consent, issues about uh, information sharing and what not. I think those are two good points to end on with. Number one, ignorance of the law is not a defense. A defense. And the other one you just said now is everything that is ethical. 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 Ethical is not the same that it's legal. <laughs> All right, I think a big clap to our panelists. Uh, we put them on the emergency medicine WhatsApp group, so you, some of you, some of the questions are not answered. Feel free to ask there, and I'm sure they can answer from there. Uh, sorry? There's a WhatsApp There's a WhatsApp group. A very hot <laughs> WhatsApp group that some of these discussions happen off, uh, offline. So, and on all, all our social media pages. So, thank you very much, Tapita Brian and Morris. Um, I think you people have been well educated on your. And yes, I will share the link on our social media pages on the emergency aspects of the Health Act. Uh, so, you're conversant with that, uh, so you know the details. Uh, so just check them up on the social media, on the website, uh, but we'll show on the social media pages. Um, and with that, that ends this month's health talk, uh, emergency care talks. And till next month, and I think July 27th. Thank you very much. Drive safe, grab some food on your way out. Um, topic. Topic, we will, we will announce. Yes, they get, they're getting hotter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Have a nice weekend.